very happy to introduce you to Dr. Raj Srinivas Parthasarathy, Head of Stroke Unit, Senior Consultant of Neurointervention and Surgery from the Artemis Agrim Institute of Neurosciences, Gurgaon. After his MBBS from MGR University, Tamil Nadu, Dr. Parthasarathy has pursued his MRCP at UK, following which he has completed his training in neurology from the Joint Royal College of Physicians. He has been conferred with a fellowship in cerebrovascular diseases from University of Alberta Hospital, Canada, in addition to doing his neurointerventional surgery fellowship from Medanta Medicity, Delhi. Dr. Raj happens to be a former colleague of our own Dr. Sooth, the senior radiologist from Gurgaon uh, in Health Map, during his fellowship days in Medanta, and he has worked under a renowned neuroradiologist, Dr. Vipul Gupta, uh, and he clearly understands the radiologist. So this will be more of a you know, clinical radiological kind of session, which will help us radiologist understand the need of a clinician imaging wise. I think we expect that input from Raj. And uh, he has, Raj has successfully handled both administrative and academic roles with numerous national and international publications and textbooks to add to his credentials. And he has been part of the esteemed Alliant trial and has delivered numerous distinguished lectures at conferences across the globe. So we are very, very fortunate to have Dr. Raj to speak to us today and uh, Hope we all benefit greatly from his experience as well as impressive credentials. He shall be talking to us on the vessel wall MRI. And uh, the session will stand out as we can all obtain a clinician's perspective. And uh, maybe as I had already discussed with Raj, he, he told that the talk is going to be at the max for 30, 35 minutes. He wants to make it like a very you know, ca capsule talk. And he feels that the attention span of everyone would be only for a short time. So he just doesn't want to, you know, deviate from that. Following that, I think we can have uh, interactive sessions and uh, we also have some asks from a clinicians what we expect clinically, you know, uh, before we, you know, do our diagnosis. So what do you, Raj? I think uh, uh, we can start the session. Thank you very much, uh, sir, for that kind introduction. Um, so I will crack on, start on with my presentation. Uh, so I'm not able to share my screen. Uh, the host has disabled, it seems. Uh, let me just tell uh, Ashish, give me a minute, please. Yeah. Ashish? Yes, sir. Uh, you are host now. Okay, okay. Thank you. Yes, sir. Yeah, I'm able to share. Thanks. This is simple. Ashish, if you can mute the rest. So, uh, good afternoon, everybody, and I thank you all for taking the time out uh, for this presentation. So, we will discuss vessel wall MRI in great detail. And before I could go on to the different aspects of what I'm going to talk about, so I wanted to discuss a case that came to us maybe uh, now two years ago. And uh, this is a 39-year-old male with uh, a right hemispheric stroke. There was no risk factors prior to this uh, presentation. And what we noticed was on angiography, if you see this is a cerebral DSA, which shows there is a tight stenosis involving the right M1 segment of the middle cerebral artery. In addition to that, we notice that this uh, iota here, the margins are irregular, both the renal artery origins are tightly stenotic. And on the uh, complete angiography, there was also left subclavian stenosis. So uh, the mesal wall MRI, uh, they, which they had done outside in a peripheral center, they said that there is a concentric enhancement. If you see, there's almost a near concentric enhancement of the vessel wall, which is thickened. I would say three fourths of the uh, circumference of the wall is involved. And they decided that it, it, it is vasculitis and they went ahead with uh, going with the steroids in this particular patient. So we will discuss this case towards the end. I'd like to have the input of the audience as to what they think might be the cause or the etiology for this particular patient. So we will discuss about uh, the objectives of the talk are, we know that vasovasura plays a huge role when we are going to image the vessel wall. So we'll talk a little bit about the vasovasura. Technical aspects are not going to go into great detail. And 
we will discuss matching of imaging findings with pathology. And in pathology, the most common, if, um, if not, I would say 80, 90% of what you're going to see on vessel wall is probably atherosclerotic disease. And therefore it needs a little bit more uh, in detail discussion. And what are the pitfalls with the imaging? So there are two arteries here, the artery X and artery Y. If you notice in the artery X, there is a good internal elastic lamina, multiple layers of internal elastic lamina, but the Y is devoid of it. And you see that there is an external elastic lamina, again, multiple layers in the artery Y, but the artery X is devoid of it. And if you see, notice the advantage here, there's no vasovasora in the artery X, but there are vasovasora in the artery Y. So the artery X would qualify for a intracranial artery where there is internal elastic lamina, there's no external elastic lamina, and there is no vasovasora. And how is the blood, I mean, uh, nutritive supply to this wall of the artery here? So from the blood, uh, so it, it supplies the inner part of the arterial wall and from the CSF, the outer part of the arterial wall. So normally the vasovasora are not present in the intracranial circulation and it develops only in disease status. So it has arteries, capillaries, and veins, which add, act as a nutritive role for the, uh, uh, for the vessel wall. And usually you would see a vasovasorum present if there are more than 29 muscular layers in the BDL. So what are the triggers for vasovasorum? It is medial thickness and luminal hypoxemia. And as a rule of thumb, if the thickness of the wall is more than 350 micron, you will have vasovasorum. And at best, you can see the vasovasora present in the proximal 1.5 centimeter of the intracranial segments. So extracranial arteries will have vasovasora, intracranial arteries are devoid of vasovasora. So there are two types of vasovasora. There's the interna, which comes from the main artery, and then externa, which comes from the side branch. So now that we have discussed briefly about vasovasora, we'll talk about the technical aspects. So the normal thickness of the arterial wall is between 0.2 and 0.3 millimeter. So for it to generate a signal, we bank on the fact that the, in a disease state, the wall will thicken so that we will get signal from the arterial wall. So you want to uh, suppress the surrounding signal, the signal from the blood as well as the neighboring tissue. And we generally prefer to use a three Tesla MRI because there's a higher signal to noise ratio. And you want to use 0.4 uh, millimeter voxel size. You want to imagine multiple lanes and use multiple tissue readings. So you want coronal, axial, sagittal, and T1 pre and post contrast, as well as we want T2 uh, sequences. So really why do this uh, imaging? It is really very important for the neurologist nowadays to really identify what these focal narrowings in the intracranial circulation are. Is it atherosclerosis or vasculitis, is it dissection, or it is moya moya or an alternate etiology? So the first thing is, will we be able to differentiate different pathologies? Can we see the not so obvious on the luminal imaging? to assess disease activity and to assess response to treatment. So there's a paper that was published in Stroke which said that if you're going to add wall imaging to luminal imaging, the chances of correct diagnosis goes from 36% to nearly a 90%, which is a significant jump. Also, if there are two people to assess the luminal imaging versus luminal imaging and wall imaging, the interrater agreement is much higher from 0.0, .0 to is extremely poor to 0.72. So therefore there's a clear role for vessel wall MRI because it increases the chances of correct diagnosis and two operators will say, will come to an agreement on that. So what are the pathologies that we normally see? We see here we have a normal vessel. We'll discuss moya moya, vasculitis, RCVS and atherosclerosis. So what happens in moya moya disease? The entima thickens, whereas the media become atrophic. And there is what is called as negative remodeling. If you see the overall diameter of this artery has shrunk. So this is called as a negatively remodeled artery. When you come to vasculitis, all three layers are involved. So there is transmural inflammation, the lumen becomes narrow and there's broken internal elastic lamina. Coming on to RCVS, it's predominantly the media, the intima and adventitia remain the same. The media is constricted, there's thickening of the media it can be up to 500 fold thickened. And coming on to atherosclerosis, the lumen can be variable. It's usually an eccentric thickening of the wall, and you can notice inflammation in the plaque. So this is a brief of what the pathogenesis about various uh, conditions. 
So let's talk about intracranial atherosclerotic disease. What's the pathogenesis, the remodeling patterns, the side of plaque and enhancement patterns. So in ICAT, the, uh, this, the initial triggering agent is wall thickening due to hypertension or diabetes, and then the vasodilator comes in and it promotes atherosclerosis. It's, it plays an important role in initiation, progression, and as well as intraplaque and resolve the bad factors that you see in the plaque. So let's discuss briefly about remodeling. There are two types of remodeling. That's called as positive remodeling and negative remodeling. Why is it important to know about positive remodeling? The lumen is not compromised in this particular con uh, condition. And 37% of intracranial atherosclerotic disease plaques cannot be assessed angiographically. And if you have positive remodeling, there's a five-fold higher probability of it being symptomatic. So there are two important anatomical parameters you should remember. So this is the outer lining of the artery, and this is the outer lining of the lumen. So you have what is called as a vessel area, you have what is called as the lumen area, and the plaque size is a vessel area minus lumen area. So what happens in positive remodeling? Consider this to be the lesion site. So in the lesion site, the vessel area is bigger than the vessel area at the reference site. Okay, so the ratio between the vessel area and the lumen to the vessel area, the reference is more than a 1.05. There's a big block burden, but the lumen is not that much narrow. So you tend to miss this on luminal imaging because the lumen is not compromised at all. When you come to negative remodeling, what happens is the vessel area at the lesion site is smaller than the vessel area at the reference site. You see the pluck is not that big, but the lumen is significantly compromised. So the ratio is less than 0.95, the plaque burden is low, and the lumen area is reduced. And the pathogenesis of how the stroke happens in these two conditions is extremely different. So let's look at why this positive remodeling is important. So this is from coronal literature. So what happens when plaque develops in the wall of the artery? So initially, when the plaque burden increases, the size of the artery keeps increasing. And in the first part, there is a compensatory over, over enlargement of the lumen of the artery as well. And initially the lumen is maintained and this phase of the artery is called as a positively remodeled phase. And beyond a certain plug burden, the outer diameter of the artery remains the same, but the lumen starts going down and eventually it becomes, the plug size also becomes bigger and becomes negatively remodeled. So what plug burden is the threshold beyond which the lumen becomes narrow. It is a 40% plaque burden in the coronary arteries and proximal internal carotid arteries is a 65% plaque burden and basilar artery, you need 55% plaque, plaque burden to actually notice that initial narrowing of the artery. So the anterior circulation and posterior circulation, are they different? Yes, they're very different. If you see the posterior circulation, it is more positively remodeled. Anterior circulation is more negatively remodeled. Let's look at an example. It's an Case of a negative remodeled artery. This is the right middle cerebral artery. There's narrowing in this particular artery. Let's look at the reference site on the left and the lesion site. If you see the outer diameter of the artery is reduced, the lumen is also reduced. So when the artery shrinks, not the lumen, the diameter itself shrinks, it's called as a negatively remodeled artery. The plaque is not active here. It's a fibrotic plaque, and the mechanism of stroke is not a plaque rupture here. Let's look at the posterior circulation the basilar artery. If you see, there's a big plaque here, but the lumen is not compromised. So here, if you see the outer diameter of the artery increases in size, the lumen is relatively maintained. And this is called what's called as a positively remodeled plaque. So many patients come to me which, with deep infarcts, which you call it as lacunar strokes. If we are able to do wall imaging, you can reclassify these patients as lacunar or cryptogenic strokes into ICAD. Now, remodeling and type of stroke, we already discussed positive remodeling means higher risk of stroke. And what also we see in uh, wall imaging and what the clinician wants to know is in which wall the plaque is located. For example, this is the middle cerebral artery, it's the sagittal section. We can divide it into four quadrants, the superior, inferior, ventral, and dorsal quadrant. And depending upon in which wall the plaque is, particularly in this particular patient, the plaque is in the interior wall. And we know this bears importance when we go ahead and stent these patients. If you see the common location is the ventral and inferior walls. If it is ventral and inferior wall, it is usually asymptomatic, but it becomes ventral and superior walls, then it becomes more symptomatic because you know the perforators are coming from the superior wall of the middle cerebral artery. And similarly, we also want to look in the basilar artery. Basilar artery, again, positive to remodeling is much more common because of low wall shear stress and lack of sympathetics in the posterior circulation. 
Again, we try to divide it into four quadrants. Uh, the ventral dorsal right and left, we know the perforators are coming from the lateral wall and therefore we want to look for plaques in the lateral wall before we go ahead and uh, intervene in this patient. Again, from coronary literature, uh, we know that the plaques form opposite to the wall of the side branch takeoff. If you see, this is the left main, left anterior descending artery, left circumference. This is the side branch and the plaque tends to form in the opposite wall, which is very beneficial for an intervention, of course. In coronary literature, if you say there is an <laughs> like this, the plaque forms in the wall opposite to the side branch. Sometimes there can be what is called as an angle takeoff, and there is a, a clockwise angle. What you see the plaque forming ipsilateral to the acute angle, and if there's an anti-clockwise takeoff, you see the plaque forming uh, in the angle in the, in the acute angle side. And this is all explained by hemodynamics, and hemodynamics plays a huge role. And we talk about two important factors: what is called as a normal stress, which is the pressure exerted on the wall of the artery perpendicular to the artery, and one other one is called as a shear stress, which is the wall. Uh, pressure exerted on the wall of the artery, which is tangential or parallel to the wall of the artery. And we are all talking about wall shear stress. Normal stress doesn't really make much of a difference. And whenever you see the bifurcation, you would have done a lot of carotid dopplers. Uh, this is the this is a common carotid artery, the internal carotid artery, external carotid artery. You tend to see the plaque on this wall. You never see the plaque on the flow divider because there's an interesting flow phenomenon that occurs. And if you see the middle cerebral artery, again, the plaque will form on the inferior wall. And if you see the painted lumen will be on the superior wall, which is very good for the interventionist. And the reason behind is this. It's a busy slide, but I'll try to make it as uh, easy as possible. So this is the common carotid artery on the left. You have the external carotid artery, you have the internal carotid artery. So this is the flow divider, which we talked about. So the high pressure jet will hit the flow divider. So whenever the flow is, uh, goes from the common carotid artery to the internal carotid artery, the flow is separated away from the wall of the internal carotid artery on the outer aspect. And the point at which it gets separated is called as a separation zone. And when it gets separated, there is a dead space that occurs in this part. So where from the flow comes into this area of the space? So we know that the high velocity jet that hits the flow divider. So if you say the central flow will be at high velocity, peripheral flow will be at low velocity. The central high velocity jet hits the flow divider, takes a circumferential path, then it goes retrograde and then an anti-grade direction into the mainstream. Similarly, there's a helical pattern of flow that goes into the dead space and goes forwards. What is the importance of that? You have this space here, which is low velocity flow. Whenever there's low velocity, there's a low shear stress. Low shear stress means there's increased plaque burden in that particular area. And you clearly see this, these two walls that are uh, there where the plaque occurs. Now let's, there are patients who don't have any atherosclerotic risk factors at all. But if you see, this is a curved artery here. This jet hits this outer wall. There's relatively less pressure on the inner wall, low velocity, low shear than the plaque forms in this wall. If you see the middle cerebral artery, there's an arc to it, and the inner arc, there will be more plaque formation. The outer arc, there's less plaque formation. So, low wall shear stress means more high risk plaque, high wall shear stress means less um, uh, high risk plaque, means it's stable plaque. And the mechanism of stroke is very different. When there's a high risk plaque, the plaque ruptures. When there is a negatively remodeled artery, that means a high wall shear stress, negatively remodeled artery, the endothelium shears off, clot forms on the wall of the artery, and that's how the stroke occurs. I'm sorry to have gone into great detail about atherosclerosis because I think it is important to understand how these plaque forms, why certain parts of the arterial wall are more affected than the other. Now, coming on to the core topic of how to identify atherosclerosis on vessel wall MRI. So we have to look at the fibrous cap, the lipid core, and the plaque contents. So you, here you have two arteries. On the right side, if you see, this is the outer diameter of the artery. So this is the lumen. You see a T2 hyperintensity, which represents the fibrous cap of the plaque. You see a hypointense area, which represents the lipid core. Here, it is T2 hypointense because it is cholesterol and cholesterol esters, not triglycerides. So this is very important to look for this uh, uh, fibrous cap because it plays a huge role in differentiating different uh, pathologies of the intracranial arteries. Another artery where there is this west outer diameter, the lumen, 
And you see there's a rupture in the fibrous cap and exposure of the underlying contents into the uh, lumen of the artery. So this is the T2 sequence, which we look out for. There is, uh, there is a heterogeneity in the T2 sequence. And then you do the pre-T1 and post-T1. And what you see is there is an enhancement of the fibrous cap. And if there is vasal vasoro, you will see a circumferential enhancement of the arterial wall also. And the lipid core will not be enhancing. So what else do you look for in the pre-T1? You also want to look for any hyperengine signal in the wall of the artery. If you see here, there's a left M1 artery. There's a tight narrowing. There's a stroke in the left temporal uh, uh, area. And this is a pre-T1 sequence, uh, T2 and the T1 sequence, pre-contrast. You see a hyperintensity, which suggests that it could be an intraplaque hemorrhage. And most uh, symptomatic plaques tend to have intraplaque hemorrhage. And this is an indirect indicator that was a symptomatic one. We also look for the extent of enhancement, and this can be graded as zero to two. You look at the pituitary stock enhancement. If it is similar to that, it is a grade two enhancement. If there's no enhancement, it is zero. And anything between these two grades, it means that it is a grade one enhancement. So no enhancement means it is less likely to be a culprit lesion. And if it's a grade two enhancement, there's a good chance that was the cause for the stroke. So the clean learnings of uh, how to identify a vessel wall MRI uh, uh, plaque is the plaque can be either positively remodeled or negatively remodeled. Positively remodeled plaques are in where the lumen is maintained, the plaque burden is high. Negatively remodeled arteries wherein the lumen is also constricted, the outer diameter of the artery is constricted. The thickening is eccentric. The uh, enhancement you can see in the fibrous cap, as well as if there's a vasovasora, because vasovasora plays an important role in atherosclerosis progression. So you'll see the outer wall of the artery enhancing. You'll find the lipid core T2 hypointense. If there is plaque hemorrhage, you will see a T1 pre-contrast hyperintensity. So these are the features that you want to look out for. And as I mentioned, if there's a juxta luminal hyper intense signal on T2 that points to atherosclerotic plaque, and we have examples to discuss about it. So moving on from atherosclerosis, we will discuss about other pathologies. Let's go on to vasculitis. There is usually a smooth, it's a concentric wall thickening enhancement. So it tends to involve all three layers, the intima, media, and uh, adventitia. There's luminal narrowing. It is uh, the diameter of the artery is relatively the same. There's increased permeability of endothelium with contrast leakage from the lumen into the arterial wall. Um, some people think that there can be vasovisorum related contrast leakage as well. So in this particular patient, if you see there's narrowing of the distal basilar artery, you see the uh, PCAs and the uh, superior cerebral arteries, there's smooth narrowing of these arteries. And this is the pre-T1 and post-T1, you see there is thickening of the wall of the artery and uh, there is a, a weight enhancement. And this is a grade two enhancement that we see generally in vasculitis. So it can be short segment, unilateral, it can be bilateral, single artery or multiple vessels. Uh, it, so one of the important features is that it tends to extend beyond the adventition to the peri-adventition tissue, and the enhancement tends to be present for longer period. If you see atherosclerosis, you see a wall that is enhancing. After four weeks, you repeat the MR vessel wall. You're not sure what it is. You repeat the MR vessel wall. Maybe four to six weeks, the enhancement is gone. But in vasculitis, the enhancement persists. It can be there up to 12 months, as I would show in one of my example cases uh, later on. Can it disease, uh, suggest disease activity? It clearly doesn't because uh, the enhancement persists for a longer period of time. There's no point repeating and saying there's enhancement and probably disease is active. Clinical monitoring is important to know if this disease is active or not. Whether it can be useful for determining the target biopsy site, there's only one paper on this where it showed that the yield was significantly high, the 90% yield. Majority of the uh, literature says the biopsy for vasculitis now, if it is not directed, the yield is extremely low in some papers as low as 36%. But in this particular page, uh, they did a whole uh, brain vessel wall MRI and they were able to target their biopsies to the enhancing arteries. So again, wanted to mention one of the pearls that has been described in literature is the left M1 cerebral artery, which is uh, significantly stenosed. You see this uh, pre T1 and post T1 contrast. There is near three fourth concentric uh, sort of enhancement uh, thickening. But if you see here on the T2, you see this uh, lumen here, 
And you see a juxta luminal T2 hyperintensity. And if you see this, then you can uh, for sure be confident that it's atherosclerosis and not vasculitis. Because we tend to say vasculitis is concentric, but it can be three-fourth or it can be near concentric. It is not always concentric. And you have to see atherosclerosis is eccentric, but it is not always the case. You can have almost involving the entire uh, circumference of the artery. Having on to uh, reversible cerebral vasoconstriction syndrome. So in the patient generally presents with recurrent uh, headaches, spoken neurological deficits, but mainly the headache is the common uh, feature and it can be thunderclap-like. And uh, generally uh, patients may have used some uh, uh, vasoactive substances. So what happens in the RCV is there is uh, uh, the intima, the inner lining of the artery becomes convoluted. There's overlap of the actin and myosin filaments in the media. There's thickening of the media. And as I said, it, it, it increases significantly. The media, medial size becomes fivefold. So what happens in RCV is normally in the initial week, the, you do, the angiography is usually normal. As time progresses, the spasm progresses from distal to proximal. And as in this particular patient, there's smooth narrowing of the middle cerebral arteries here. If you notice, and at three months, the angiography becomes normal. Generally, there may, may uh, if the enhancement is there, it is only grade one enhancement. Usually, there is no enhancement. The wall can be thickened. The wall may not be thickened as well. It generally, resolves in six months. So the important take-home messages of how I am going to differentiate ICAD from vasculitis from RCVs. The first pointer would be looking at the T2 sequence. Is there a juxtaluminal T2 hyperintensity? If it is there, it is ICAD for sure. Generally, in vasculitis and RCVs, it is going to be absent. Then I'm going to look at the wall thickness. Is it what is the pattern of involvement? Is it eccentric? Is it circumferential? It is 90% of ICAD will have eccentric involvement. Circumferential in 70% of patients in vasculitis, the rest can be not necessarily circumferential. And RCV, as they said, is around 50% at a circumferential and 30% that can be wall. The thickness may not be there. Coming on to uh, enhancement in an intensity, the grade of enhancement. If you notice in ICAD, it is grade one. Vasculitis, it's almost the enhancement is like a pituitary stock. It has to be very avid enhancement. And RCVS, it can be mostly there is no enhancement in the vessel wall. Now, now that we have discussed these three diseases, we'll go to Moya Moya disease. It's a very interesting disease based on the pathology and the uh, imaging features. If you see here, this is a normal vessel. This is a Moya Moya vessel. We had already discussed that. One is the intima thickens significantly. So it is almost uh, threefold thickened in the Moya Moya disease as compared to the normal vessel, whereas the atrophy, uh, there is atrophy of the media. So what happens is relatively the wall thickness is preserved in Moya Moya. So the outer diameter progressively decreases. So it's a negatively remodeled artery, but the wall thickness is, uh, remains the same or sometimes increases the wall thickness of the uh, Moya Moya zone. So if you see here, uh, there is a um, uh, terminal IC involvement here. If you see here, this is the terminal ICs which are coming and narrowing down here at this point here. And if you see there is wall thickening, but there is no enhancement at all. And it's a negatively remodeled artery. There's, the size of the artery has gone down. So the outer diameter has gone down in Moya Moya disease and atherosclerosis, it goes up. And if you see the wall thickness is I had mentioned in the past, it's 0 0.2, 0 0.3 millimeters. The wall thickness can be remaining normal or slightly increased. Of course, in atherosclerosis, the wall thickness significantly increases. And in Moya Moya, the signal intensity is homogeneous, whereas in atherosclerosis, the signal intensity you will have in T2 death will be definite heterogeneity of signal in the vessel wall. Now, moving on to whether it has a role in aneurysms, we know vasovasorum, uh, there is no definite role in the formation of an aneurysm. How does it influence growth of aneurysm? We know that saccular aneurysms, more than four millimeter and fusiform aneurysm, it may play a role. We may be able to identify unstable intracranial aneurysms, and we also may be able to identify the aneurysm which is ruptured in a patient with a diffuse subrachoid hemorrhage. So, what you look for is a circumferential aneurysmal wall enhancement. And if there's a significant, uh, if it is a grade three circumferential arterial wall enhancement, then you know that that is an unstable aneurysm impending rupture. Or if you have multiple aneurysms, as in this particular case, there's a right PCOM, there's a left 
left pecum and post contrast you see the left pecum arterial wall is enhancing and I know for a fact that the left pecum is ruptured rather than the right pecum. So these are some of the uh, uh, utility that we have for the vessel wall. And there are some uh, interesting facts. So in the, after post-thrombectomy, they generally note that there can be arterial wall enhancement because there can be injury to the endothelial uh, lining of the artery and you can have a concentric wall enhancement and leakage of contrast from within the arterial wall, artery into the arterial wall. Some of the pitfalls, if there is a slow flow in the wall of the artery, it can show as if the wall is thickened. And uh, sometimes there are venules that go very close by the arterial wall. And I've seen people refer, uh, uh, reporting that as enhanced uh, uh, vessel wall, uh, but that is not the case. So look for uh, close by venules which are enhancing. You track them, you will see that it will be going all the way along the arterial wall. So you, you know that it is a venule. So this is here, it looks like an eccentric wall thickening, but on post contrast, you see the lumin luminous filling well filling. So I'll go through some example cases that we have come coming with. This is a 22-year-old female. She has a family history of Fabry's disease, has cataract and skin disease with the right hemispheric stroke. If you see, this is the first event. There's a hemodynamic infarct in the right middle cell artery territory. She had a complex aortic arch. And if you see, this is the first uh, angiography. There's narrowing of the terminal IC. You see the A1 AC is barely filling. At this point, we did a vessel wall MRI. This is the pre-T1. Uh, this is the post-T1 axial and coronal imaging. If you see, there is a grade two enhancement and uh, there is thickening of the wall. It is near concentric thickening of the wall and avid enhancement. We thought it is likely to be a vasculitic in origin. So what happened to this lady? Two weeks later, she had another event. And if you see, there is some hemodynamic, um, uh, so it almost three weeks later, uh, so, sorry, 10 weeks later, she had another event. And at that point, she had a, a recurrent stroke here. And if you see this persistent enhancement at 10 weeks, a plaque is not going to enhance, there, there won't be any persistent enhancement. After four weeks, it has to go away. And beautiful imaging here is just uh, concentric thickening, enhancement, there's significant more narrowing of the terminal ICA. A third event further and uh, uh, so eventually, so one of the important take home messages when we are reporting is if you're suspecting vasculitis, then we don't stent these patients. This is a young lady suspected vasculitis. She has to go for a bypass uh, rather than stenting. So this is one of the important uh, messages that I would like to convey through this case. Another uh, doctor, 37-year-old with right-sided symptoms. This is something which I posted. This is the uh, angiography, which shows a left M1 near cutoff. This is the DSA, which shows a tight stenosis. Again, when you look at this imaging, you see there is the lumen is almost eccentric here. There is a plug. Uh, it looks like a plug because it's eccentric lumen. And as we mentioned, if there's a curved artery, even if you don't have atherosclerotic risk factors, hemodynamics say that you can potentially have atherosclerosis and uh, uh, intracranial risk for disease. So this is the <clears throat> later phase imaging. This is the pre-T1. Uh, this is the pre-T1, and this is uh, blood black sequences. Uh, this is the pre-T1 and post. If you see, there's an eccentric thickening and enhancement of this uh, plaque that was noted in the inferior aspect of the uh, middle cell artery. So certainly with confidence, I'm able to say there's eccentric thickening, eccentric enhancement. So this patient, this doctor has atherosclerosis rather than vasculitis. So another important thing I wanted to point out is the involvement of atherosclerosis is, uh, uh, does not generally, even if you have an M1 stenosis, it generally does not involve the terminal IC and A1. If you have vasculitis, it tends to involve the terminal IC A1 and M1. So that is an important feature that I keep in mind when I'm evaluating these patients. Uh, this is a, another case which I wanted to say that there's a 35-year-old female with right-sided symptoms, no underlying illness. You see clearly this terminal IC is narrowed, A1 is narrowed, the M1 is also not looking good. And this is a... Uh, um, uh, post contrast T1 imaging, which shows clearly concentric wall uh, thickening and enhancement, which would favor vasculitis. And you see, at nine months, we have done this imaging, and again, there is still enhancement. Of course, the disease has not been, she did not have any, she was put on steroids and disease modifying therapy. She has not had any further events, and therefore, this enhancement can persist, and we don't go by the enhancement. 
So now coming on to the first case, provided if you all had been listening to my talk, then we would uh, ask some audience to sort of participate in this case if that's okay. So what do you think? The 43-year-old male with diabetic and hypertensive, uh, sorry, no, he, sorry, he didn't have a, a risk factor here. So he had M1 stenosis. This is what you see in the renal artery. So when I asked the renal physician, she says it is probably Takayasu because both sides, um, renal arteries are involved. Subclavian is stenosed, M1 is stenosed. And if you see, they, it was reported as near concentric enhancement. How many of you would agree with this, uh, with this diagnosis? Okay, let's move on and I'll just play the video for you. This is the pre-T1 imaging. Okay, so what do we see in this pre-T1 imaging? Pre-contrast T1, Sagittarius. So we have only a few more slides, so I just... Um, so if you see the pre-T1, you see this uh, eccentric sort of thickening, and you see this hyperintensity on the wall of the artery. So this part here, if you notice here, so this gives a clue to what, what it could be, the diagnosis as such. And now notice the post-contrast imaging. So you see that this is almost eccentric here, but later on it becomes near concentric, or at least three fourths of the artery being involved. So that probably was the reason at this point that the uh, radiologist that had reported had said it is vasculitis. But as I mentioned, the important factor to look out for is the T2 imaging. So let's look at this T2. This is the terminal ICA. As we come up, this is the M1. And I clearly see there is a juxtalubinal hyperintense signal, now, which would point to the fact that it is a, a fibrous character, uh, atherosclerotic in origin rather than vasculitis. So it's a very interesting beautiful imaging for this particular patient at least. So uh, this turned out to be atherosclerotic and we went, we went ahead and stented this patient. Uh, because the patient had uh, recurrent events. This is another case where uh, this you see that this is a T2 sequence where there's a juxtaluminal T2 hyperintensity and on post-contrast T1, there is a sort of enhancement of this uh, cap, fibrous cap. And there can be enhancement of the sort of uh, arterial wall also because this is just proximal in the supraplanoid segment here. You can have as a visitor and it can enhance. And one of the cases where uh, that really intrigued us and uh, um, I'll present the case to you. This is a 23-year-old male who presented with a right basal ganglia and fox. So he came to us maybe a month into the illness. So he had first right basal ganglia infarct and he had a left deep infarct. And then he came, I think at this point to us when he had a DWI restriction, the left side of the brain and multiple sort of micro hemorrhages in the deep uh, basal ganglia. <clears throat> and if you show here, if you see the DSA, this is the cerebral angiography of the right uh, internal cerebral artery, internal cerebral artery. If you see these um, uh, sort of uh, androsomal dilatations noted in the lenticostriate arteries, multiple of them. And uh, this is the lateral view, which again shows this uh, picture here. You see the slow filling of these aneurysms that are sitting in the lenticostriate arteries. And this is the uh, expert CT angiography, which shows multiple small, small aneurysms in the lenticle spires. And uh, if you see the left side also, is what a uh, um, uh, couple of, uh, uh, I mean, uh, nearly 20, uh, 10 to 20 aneurysms, multiple small, small aneurysms in the lenticle spires. And we did a vessel wall imaging just for interest. And what you notice was uh, in the post contrast, we could see the wall of the aneurysm really thicken and enhancing, which was not there. On, if you see this image here, the, really the anti lenticlostriate arteries, there was wall uh, inflammation of the wall and uh, enhancement. We started on a particular treatment. So, of course, we do a lumbar puncture in these patients because they suspected vasculitis and probably an infective vasculitis. Uh, although we didn't know that it would be infected, but the uh, biofire panel came up to be a herpes simplex uh, type 1. And he was started on acyclovir and uh, exactly sort of uh, seven to eight days into the illness, he developed a bleed in the left side of the brain. 
So then we image these vessels again and significant resolution of the aneurysms. You can see here there's a little bit of aneurysm left here. And this is uh, these are the small aneurysms that we see at maybe seven, eight days, and at six months it is all gone. And this is one of the infective cases where we do in the vessel wall imaging, which showed thickening and concentric enhancement of the wall. And this is probably the uh, this is extremely rare presentation of the simplex. It causes necrosis of the artery wall. And um, uh, we have, I have not seen a case like this before. The last pitfall where, uh, where people have reported as vasculitis is looking at the ICA in the cavernous and this uh, proximal supraclanoid segment where there will be normal enhancement of vasovasorum and we cannot call it as vasculitis and patients come to be being reported as vasculitis. So let's uh, go over the different etiologies and how to identify. So you have this uh, artery. What do you think the diagnosis is here? So this is negatively remodeled on post contrast. So why I say negatively remodeled, the diameter of the artery is reduced. The lumen is also reduced. The wall is near normal or slightly increased. So the diagnosis goes for Moya Moya disease. Okay. So there can be grade one, but usually it is non enhancing. Now, coming to this one, so it is uh, the, the diameter of the artery essentially doesn't change much. But if you see the wall thickness is increased, it is concentrically increased, the lumen is slightly narrowed. And if you give contrast, it's going to enhance completely. And this goes for a vasculitic pattern of involvement. So uh, for Moya Moya, you have a biphasic involvement. So you see between uh, 10 and 20 and another age group uh, near 40 and 50. This, uh, there's a, um, uh, both these groups can have Moya Moya disease. And uh, to say it is Moya Moya disease, you have to rule out uh, alternate etiology. And for us, uh, uh, to say Moya Moya disease on angiography on DSA, we want a dural supply to the to that part of the brain. That the dural supply means it is a very long-standing illness, and then we are pretty confident that it it, it goes for uh, a Moya Moya disease. So you have vessel wall, you have the angiographic pattern, and then you decide it is Moya Moya disease or Moya Moya phenomenon. The vasculitis comes in Moya Moya phenomenon. You see a lot of focal vasculopathies nowadays with this concentric enhancement in young ladies. We keep following them up. We put them on disease modifying therapy. Some of the extremely rare, the one progression where we had to go for bypass surgery. In these patients, the distal, the rest of the vessels are all looking normal. It's just a focal vessel that is involved. And what we do is we do a CSF and look for varicella in these patients. And we've seen that varicella vasculitis can cause a focal vasculopathy and we put them on val, uh, val cyclover. Okay. Moving on to the this, this condition here, if you see here, even on the pre-contrast, there is a eccentric thickening and a T1 hyperintensity. So this can be two possibilities. One, it can be dissection involving the wall of the artery, or it can be an intraplaque hemorrhage. So if you have a pre-T1, which is uh, hyperintense, these are the two possibilities. And the last possibility where there is eccentric uh, thickening and eccentric enhancement, which would go for atherosclerosis. And in this particular instance, always look for T2 sequences, that T2 heterogeneity, there's a juxtaluminal T2 hyperintensity. Look at the T1, is there a pre-T1, pre-contrast T1 uh, hyperintensity to go for a plaque uh, hemorrhage. Thank you very much for patience. <laughs> I think it was a very crisp and a good presentation. So, I think we should we are done. Thank you, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Raj. It was yeah, it was really you. an inspiring uh, lecture for all of us. Thanks a lot. Hope to have you once again to talk on something else. Uh, okay. Okay. So thank you. Yes. Yeah, thank sure, you very sure. much for having thank you. you. And thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, 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 everyone. Neeraj. Thanks, Shashank. You want to tell anything? I see Neeraj in the. Maybe he's he's logged off. Okay. Fine. Thank you. Thank you so much. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.